This video is sponsored by Normandy 1998, Ash and Team Valor. In the aftermath of their adventure with the Lake Trio, Ash, Barry, Caitlin, Brandon, Peony, and Paul return to the Battle Pyramid for a well-earned meal and a good rest, having no trouble getting to sleep after all they went through this evening. Thanks to picking up the habit from their time as underbutlers, Ash and Barry are the first to rise, having shared Ash's room, with the pair deciding to head down to the Pyramid's battlefield with the intentions of getting some early morning training in before breakfast. As they descend, Barry attempts to crack jokes with his rival and buddy at Caitlin's expense, stating that he wants to take bets on how long the princess will sleep in after the wild ride they just had, though in a stone-cold deadpan, Ash reminds his hasty companion that their psychic friend is probably able to still hear his smack talk in her sleep, so he should be more careful. At these words, Barry goes pale, though before he can ask Ash whether he really means it or is just joking, the two boys come across several others who all appear to have the same plan for their morning routine as them. Occupying the battlefield and the sideline space next to it are none other than Paul and a quite powerful and healthy-looking Electabuzz, with the likes of Peony and Ash's father surveying the pair's training offering critique, praise, and advice as Electabuzz practices its moves while the two veteran trainers enjoy some coffee. Nonetheless, happy to have the fellowship and celebration from the night prior continue, even if it means their scheme isn't as special as they had thought, Ash and Barry greet and join the others with a pair of good mornings and receive three back in kind with Barry curiously going on to ask exactly how long everyone has been up, since he thought Derek was an early tour chick. Paul, in a stoic but undeniably friendly manner, offers that he and Electabuzz have only been up and practicing for about five minutes, while Penny laughs heartily and slaps Brandon on the back as he admits that he only got a few hours of sleep himself before getting up for a bit of light training with his team like usual. But Brandon, on the other hand, he's always been able to make a knockdown blush with how sturdy his sleeping habits are, even when pulling all-nighters. Obviously impressed by this despite his need for speed, Barry looks to both Brandon and an Ash for confirmation, before declaring he's never been able to go full throttle without a good long nap, even if he's not as bad about his beauty sleep as, well, you know who. Despite having nearly been made to choke on his own cup of coffee, Brandon somewhat tersely admits he's been guilty of burning the candle at both ends on far more occasions than he can reliably count, many a time due to poring over and obsessing about some new artifact, discovery or rumour, and all the while interspersing his Pokemon's training, exercise and care, as that is what it takes to be a good frontier brain. At the same time, when Ash was born he had to juggle that as well, and he would be the first to bluntly tell anyone the boy was far less predictable or manageable than even the crankiest of Reggie's, a statement which earns him a NO from Ash, almost on par with his own, before the boy circles back to something Peony mentioned that had piqued his interest, asking why exactly they'd been pulling all-nighters after the adventure they just had. Seeing his son's spirit of adventure firing right back up, Brand enjoys Peony and his laughter, seeing no point in playing coy, and so fills Barry, Paul, and Ash in on what has he and the other adventurers so excited, which is a series of ruins regarding a pair of hitherto unheard of Reggies buried in a temple in the Gala region's Crown Tundra, with that being the Battle Pyramid's current destination. As expected, this elicits excitement from all three boys, Ash for the same reasons as Brandon, as he's excited to go on another dungeon crawling challenge, the more perilous and unbelievable the better, especially if it means he can help his dad meet and capture two more of the mythical golems he's fought so hard to find. In contrast, Barry's excited at the prospect of a quick detour journey to another region, knowing it'll be great training, or Paul expresses similar interest, though more because he's heard the Gala region hosts the world's most competitive Pokemon League. Pride swelling at these words, Peony confirms these words to be correct, proving himself a true child at heart, as stars appear in his eyes, and he encourages all three boys to someday visit the region proper and give the League a challenge, as he'd be more than happy to sponsor them. With the lower level now abuzz due to all the energy coming off the young trainers, it's no wonder they eventually wake Kate from her rest far earlier than she would have liked, with her popping into the room casually and yawning while flicking Barry between the eyes. As he jumps and yells in shock asking what that was for, Caitlin confirms Ash's earlier theory about her abilities while ordering her ex-butler to stop whining and fill her in on the rest. Taking this as a sign that their revelry has ended, Brandon excuses himself to go update his travel log, while Paul, taking the opportunity to make a challenge and avoid Barry whining about it not being towards him, locks eyes with Ash, suggesting they use this transit time to make good on their planned battle. Quickly arriving on the same page despite lacking mind reading abilities of his own, Ash happily agrees, able to feel a certain ball in his belt heat up slightly, and so before long, he and Paul have taken up opposite sides of the battlefield, with an eager peony agreeing to referee the match. As they don't know exactly how long the flight will be, both both boys agree to a 1v1, with Paul not needing long to choose having Electabuzz come back from where it was leaning against the side of the battlefield, wanting to both show his growth from their last encounter and take advantage of the improvement and warm-up he and Electabuzz have just gone through. Meanwhile, Ash calls out Chimchar, as it will be good to show it how far Paul has come, and in turn, show Paul the growth the Simeon has had. 
Wanting a strong start, Ash takes the first move by having Chimchar belch out a flamethrower at Electabuzz, which Paul out as a protector counter, with a dome of energy enveloping the lightning monster and shielding it from the fire. Then, when the attack ends, Paul is quick to call for a thunderbolt, with the pendulum swinging in the other direction, seeing Chimchar on the defensive, having to dig down into the pyramid's packed earth battlefield in order to avoid this. Seeing a change in strategies in order, Ash and Chimchar swap to physical attacks, using a trick Goodbye to taught the fire monkey, in order to use its dig to distract the opponent and create an opening at the cost of some of the move's power, though Ash is quick to think of a way to mitigate this weakness by comboing the move with Flame Wheel as soon as Chimchar bursts from the hole, in what would surely be a critical hit if not for Paul ordering a Thunder Punch to block it and send Chimchar skidding back. Believing this strategy could still work, albeit with some slight tweaking, Ash prepares to call for another flamethrower, though before he does, Paul tells Electabuzz to use a move he's never seen from it before, Rain Dance, causing a small shower to suddenly manifest indoors and stream down into the battlefield, reducing the power of all of Chimchar's fire moves and making it so Electabuzz's attacks will hit far more easily. Seeing the overall intent of this strategy, Ash has to admit that when Electabuzz learns and masters Thunder, they'll have one killer moveset. But for now, he and Chimchar are going to keep on burning despite the pouring rain, with Ash ordering the flaming simian right back into the ground at double time, as Paul orders a volley of thunderbolts to chase after it as it goes. Thanks to Chimchar's own speed and the quickly softening dirt around it absorbing the electricity, these are all misses, though only just. A failing Paul will not repeat, as his Electabuzz keep blasting the ground with Thunderbolt to tear it up and drive Chimchar into the open where it will be vulnerable. Seeing that the ground won't shield them for much longer, Ash puts his faith in Chimchar to surpass its limits, and so orders it to rush Electabuzz with Dig, though in truth, this is not the full frontal assault it appears to be and rather the beginning of a much more wily strategy, as by tearing up the sodden ground further, it quickly grows unstable, especially around Electabuzz due to the whole Chimchar emerged from last time, seeing the electric only sink down to its waist in the mud. Seeing this is their chance to end things, Chimchar then leaps out of the dirt and prepares to attack, only to be caught under the jaw with a full power thunder punch courtesy of its ex-teammate, which sends it crashing to the ceiling with a heavy cracking sound. However, this is an unintended side effect, as Chimchar's blaze begins to activate, causing its tail flame to not only grow in size, but also wrap around Chimchar for a huge flame wheel that comes tearing down like a meteor thanks to gravity's added force. Having seen the power of Chimchar's blaze before, Paul has Electabuzz employ Protect again, though it requires a great deal of energy to maintain the dome meaning he will not be able to hold on for long. Showing a bit of his old tactical ruthlessness, Paul orders Electabuzz to unleash a full force thunderbolt and smash Chimchar between the protect barrier and the bolt of lightning, with the electric type doing him one better, as when the move hits, it is with thunder rather than thunderbolt, having risen to match Chimchar, so that now it is anyone's guess who will come out on top. However, showing his continued faith in Chimchar, Ash encourages it not to panic or lose its cool, and to just keep spinning, something Chimchar does, its flame wheel burning brighter as it takes on a golden hue, which crackles with extra energy. This at last proves too much for Electabuzz, with cracks forming on its protective dome before shattering as Chimchar punches through and slams into it with enough force to lightly shake the battle pyramid and kick up a cloud of dust. When this fades, Electabuzz is unable to battle, while Chimchar is just barely standing, having even lost the strength to maintain Blaze, though it is undeniably the winner. As Peony calls the battle to a close, both trainers approach and shake hands, praising the other's Pokemon and effort, with Paul taking a moment to acknowledge Chimchar finally, stating that it's truly earned his respect. This elicits a delighted squeal from the chimp as it eagerly leaps up and attempts to hug Ash, Paul, and Electabuzz, while from the other end of the room, Brandon re-enters and surveys the boys with a look of pride on his face. In his usual austere manner, the Pyramid King agrees that they both did well, while reflecting on how having raised a strong world son was instrumental in being able to help shape Paul's worldview, as otherwise, he certain they wouldn't have seen eye to eye and would have made much less progress. So in many ways, Ash and the strides he's made on his own journey helped Paul just as much as he did. This overly sentimental moment is much too sweet for Paul, with him easing out of the group hug and returning Electabuzz with a red face, while Caitlin and Barry tease that this display was the cutest thing they've ever seen Paul do, causing the purple-haired boy to harumph sternly, while Ash laughs, asking if he would like to go another round. However, Paul declines, wanting to give his team some time to rest while reflecting on their match, with this leaving a vacancy on the field that Barry is more than happy to fill, as he levels a challenging glare at Ash, Brandon, Peony, or whoever will be willing to take him on for some training of his own with the result being a 2v2 of Ash and Barry versus the rivals of the previous generation in Brandon and Peony. Despite all the boys' progress and great synchronicity, the teamwork and prowess of the veteran trainers is simply greater, with the rest of the flight to Gala being spent on the youngsters trying out new strategies to take down the Champion and Pyramid King when they eventually get their rematch. This thankfully serves as more than enough entertainment to get our heroes through the rest of the morning, with them not stopping until Peony yells for them all to get dressed in cold weather gear, since the Crown Tundra makes Snow Point seem like a Lola. He then points out one of the Battle Pyramid's many windows, and as the kids look out at the blanket of snow drawing closer and closer, they realize they've finally arrived 
arrived in the Gala region. Brimming with excitement as the massive flying structure's entry ramp slowly extends to the snowy ground, Barry is, as expected, the first one to set foot and technically start off this new adventure, his eyes wide and his murder mouth running a mile a minute as he tries to scope out any new or powerful Pokemon, with this quickly resulting in the others concluding he needs a chaperone so he doesn't get lost or into trouble. Just as predictably, Caitlin volunteers to do so in a haughty fashion, while despite his certainty the duo will make his own exploration a bit more tedious, Paul volunteers to tag along to make sure Caitlin doesn't kill the blonde thus taking a small weight off of Ash's shoulders. While he is just as excited as Brandon about this new possible discovery, Peony is also eager as the group's Galarian representative to give an advent tour, as he calls it, of one of his region's most majestic and brutal environments, offering to show the trio a max raid den if they're lucky, with this promptly seeing them form an exploration team all of their own. This just leaves Ash and Brandon, who are still as determined as ever to make their way to the rumoured ruins, despite the fact a battle with giant Pokemon sounds quite interesting to both. Though, as Brandon is quick to point out, if this is anything like catching the other Reggies, they will have a truly titanic battle waiting for them at the ruins. And so it is that Brandon and Ash make their way to a location known as Three Point Pass, while the King fills his son in on some of the specifics of the rumours they're investigating, such as the local stories surrounding these two new Reggies. He also points out their destination on his map, naming this place the Split Decision Ruins, a name that forces Ash to wonder what decisions they might have to make when they arrive. However, before they face any decisions, they must first make it to the ruins, with it thankfully being nowhere as arduous as it could be, since it's small inconveniences like an overabundance of snow, steep climbs or debris in their path, Ash is reminded just how handy reg ice, rock and steel have been in making Brandon as successful and well-traveled an explorer as he is, so that before long, the father and son find themselves at the foot of a large ornate and old looking temple-like structure, built in a manner true to its divisive name, as half of it is painted a deep tyrannical crimson, while the other is a bright shocking yellow, with both halves being for the most part unmarred by either the elements or the passage of time. Rubbing his chin in wonder at this, Ash has as a guess that these colours are surely tied to something important, possibly a reference to the colours of Regigigas' eyes and golden accents, but then just as quickly refines his hypothesis to be more centred around the temple's specific inhabitants. Mimicking the rubbing gesture, Brandon concurs, offering his son the extra info that these new golems are likely single-typed, the same as the other Regis, but more important, he is curious if they will further his theory that each legendary titan was created to mark and reflect an age of humanity. Having heard this theory of his father's before, but at the same time lacking his eloquence, Ash tries to come to the same conclusion, citing how Regirock kind of represents how humans would have been back as cavemen, while Reg Ice marks the shift into smarter people, capable of surviving the harsh cold, and Reggie still stands when they finally learn to make and use metal for stuff like big strong buildings. Despite the crude conclusion, Brandon praises Ash's wit, as well as his prudence, since he's always been a proponent of looking and analysing before leaping into things like this. Though, as both are curious, the father and son do step close enough to examine the markings on the door turn door. To this end, Brandon asks what could come next for humanity, and what typings would correspond with these progress points that haven't been used yet. Thinking about it from this perspective, at least one answer becomes immensely clear, with Ash pointing to the yellow side, and theorising an electric type would by all means be the best representative of where humanity currently is, but as for what could come between the hypothetical metal and electric ages eludes him. Regardless, Brandon agrees that his thought process is the same, and that if this is to be the case, and the rumours prove to be true, this should be enough to go off of, despite half of the temple remaining a mystery to them as the duo proceed inside. With a casualness only available to those who have built a life out of deciphering ancient texts and defeating elemental behemoths, Brandon rubs his hand across small bumps built into the door, though before he can convey the translation to Ash, seven white dots appear over the red and yellow patterns on the door, in a formation meant to invoke the pattern of Regigigas' eye, and like a master key, the door slides open readily, allowing the stale air inside to begin moving after only Arceus knows how long. Now feeling even more excited as the credibility of these rumours increases by the minute, Ash suggests that maybe the reason no one else has been able to get in here is because they needed the three Reggies. After all, his dad did say he needed to meet special conditions to find the others. Not to mention, if the Reggies are all connected like he theorised, maybe they are intended to visit each other's shrines by making the same continental migration their creator did. This theory is certainly an intriguing one, and something Brandon would quite like to unpack later, though for now he is too engrossed in the architecture and aesthetic of the temple's interior for such things going to snap a few photos as they make their way into a large room, with multiple button-like circles positioned on the floor, and a large strange-looking statue at the centre of the room. 
In this venture, Ash defers to Brandon's expertise, as here the Pyramid King expresses both familiarity with the style of setup, as well as nostalgia to older journeys, reminding Ash of stories of some of his first meetings with the Reggies, and how he'd struggled to figure out their puzzles. Luckily, Brandon is far more experienced now, already having an idea how to solve this temple's riddle, asking Ash to wait where he is, before striding into the room proper, and meticulously stepping on a specific sequence of stone buttons to push them down in a pattern, one Ash eventually recognises the same one carved into the stone arch above the yellow side of the temple. When Brandon completes his sequence, the various eyes of the statue begin to glow and crackle with electricity, while a hidden passage to the statue's right begins to slide open. Excitedly, Ash cheers and runs to join his dad, but as he steps through the threshold into the puzzle chamber, the statue's glow is lost, and the secret door just as quickly slides back into place, as if nothing happened. Perplexed more than upset, Brandon asks Ash to step back, and surprisingly, the effects of his actions are also undone, with the statue crackling back to life and the secret door sliding open once more. Seeing this, Brandon takes a step forward, and these phenomena go unchanged, leading him to believe that only one person can go down each path, as it were. So he'll have to take the door to the right, and meet Ash on the other side, assuming this might be the third point of the pass as the name suggests. A tiny bit nervous, but still confident as he's with his dad, Ash gives him the go-ahead to step through the door and leave him on his own, a bit thankful as he does, since it gives him a chance to run back to the entrance and copy the pattern above the crimson doorway so he can open the other door. After completing the puzzle for the red side, the statue she once again glows, this time leaking dense scarlet energy as a door on the opposite side slides open, and though unsure of what it is he will face, Ash steps forward. When the door shuts behind him, Ash finds himself in pitch darkness, but before he can bring out Meltan or Chimchar to help light his way, he feels something press against him, and so jumps while letting out a terrified yell. Looking around frantically for the source, he finds the stern face of his father illuminated by a flashlight, which truthfully terrifies him even more. Though seeming completely unfazed by Ash's reaction, Brandon simply greets him with an, oh, it's just you, son, before sweeping his torch's light throughout the chamber. From the looks of things, it is around the same dimensions as the last one, with the only thing occupying it being a strange looking pile of blue rings, and what looks to be a stone carving over the head of a nondescript reptilian Pokemon. As both are curious and more than a little worried that the temple may have already been stripped of all its treasures and secrets, the father and son hastily step deeper into this section of the dungeon, and are thus taken by surprise when energy seems to hum and rumble through the old structure, illuminating the room and making it possible to see clearly. However, this shock is nothing compared to what they see before them, as now it previously seemed like odd furnishings of the ancient temple are beginning to move, as the blue rings suddenly start to crack with electricity and float, while the stone Pokemon head begins to rattle and shake, while leaking that red energy from from before. Then suddenly, eyes in the patterns they'd created flash into life upon these ornaments, revealing them to be the two new Reggies. One, as presumed, a golem of pure electric power, quickly bouncing around and sparking, while the other is produced by the stone Pokemon head opening with a roaring sound, and taking on an eerie black colour, as a bright jewel-like core is revealed inside the maw of what Ash now recognises as a dragon, with these draconic features becoming the creature's arms. Then as one, the duo of golems buzz and rumble at their respective names, Reggie Dragon, Drago and Reggie Lecky, who can only be described as a call to battle. This leads Ash to finish up his earlier theory by proposing that a Reggie representing the dragon type could also represent the brutal and tyrannical nature of people after they made that advance up to the Middle Age, with Brandon in complete agreement, positing his own theory that these two Reggies are not meant to be taken in tandem, meaning some special criteria has likely been fulfilled. Regardless, for now he will require Ash's assistance, to which the boy is more than happy to provide, already prepared with a perfect candidate of both these lost Reggies as he chooses Gabite, completely nullifying the abilities of Reggie Lecky due to its ground typing, and being effective against Reggie Drago thanks to possessing the dragon type. What's more, if his dad goes with Reggie Steel or Regice, he'll have a very strong core of defense and offense, though what Brandon chooses couldn't shock Ash more, as with a respectful entreaty, he summons the creator golem itself, Reggie Gigas, to serve as Gabite's battle partner. Both shocked and elated by this, Ash asks how this is possible, with his father coolly explaining that it was at the end of the day both the most logical and humane way to save Reggie Gigas from falling into the hands of Hunter J or one of her buyers. Not to mention, it was amusing when a simple Pokeball was all it took to ruin her elaborate, and no doubt expensive, plans. Even so, Regigigas does not wield power without a cost, as Brandon informs Ash of the slow start ability, meaning for the first leg of this battle, Ash and Gabite will have to do the majority of the battling while also shielding the golem. Nodding his understanding, Ash prepares to call for a bulldoze on Regilecki, wanting to deal some damage and make Gabite look like the bigger threat. Though as you will soon learn, the electric Reggie is operating on a totally separate concept of speed, already flashing in front of both Gabite and its creator with
with no hesitation to deliver a powerful thunderbolt. Though shocked, both literally and figuratively, Ash and Goodbye don't change course, since this does no damage and still protects Reggie Yigus, but Reggie Lecky is not their only opponent, with this becoming clear the moment it zips out of the way just as quickly, leaving Goodbye in prime position to be slammed brutally by Reggie Drago's Hyper Beam. If not for Reggie Gigas using Protect, this might have been the end for Gabite, with Ash bashfully thanking his dad for the assist and promising not to repeat the same mistake, as he tells Gabite to focus his attention on taking out Reggie Drago while it recharges, as it is weak to the Landshark's dragon move. Though unfortunately, Reggie Lecky is just as much of a team player as its partner, using its incredible speed to trap Gabite in its signature Thunder Cage, so that when Reggie Drago is back in fighting shape, it can finish the other Dragon type off. Thankfully, here Dig becomes the most powerful weapon, as Gabite dives through the stony floor of the battlefield, only to appear beneath Reggie Lecky, catching it by surprise and dealing the first super effective damage of the match. Bolstered by this, Ash next calls for Dragon Breath on Reggie Drago, though it seems the Titanic Drake also knows this move, creating a stalemate as the two beams clash, with neither being able to land a decisive blow. However, proving Ash's assessment that this Reggie represents a cruel and barbaric age right, Reggie Drago plays both Ash and Gabite for fools by fainting as if it is going to charge another easily telegraphed hyper beam, though just as Ash orders his partner to dodge and counter this, Reggie Drago just as quickly dissipates the glowing normal type energy before rising into the air and leaking that draconic power once more as its dragon head clamps around its jewel of a body, only to snap open with a different kind of high-powered beam attack that goes slamming into Gabite, painfully driving it back. Worriedly, Ash cries for Gabite while looking at his dad with just a hint of reproach at how long Reggie Gigas needs to charge up. Though calm as ever, Brandon simply utters the word, soon, with this seemingly being all he intends to give his son in the way of comfort. Meanwhile, still in the midst of this draconic deluge, Gabite fights to stay conscious, with Ash urging it to hold strong, and that is exactly what it does, digging its feet in and hunkering down to weather this mighty dragon attack for the sake of its trainer and friend. This resolve, along with the massive amount of draconic energy flowing through and around it, allows Gabite to tap into a new level of power as it begins to burn with a ferocious evolutionary light while transforming into the majestic pseudo-legendary Garchomp. Whilst looking worse for wear, there is an unmistakable aura of draconic power to Garchomp now, not dissimilar from Reggie Drago, though while the Titans leaks from its body, Garchomp holds its strength within, unleashing it through the newly learned move Outrage, as it begins literally swimming through Reggie Drago's massive beam attack to slam into it, creating an explosion that sees both dragons blown apart and sent hurtling to the ground unconscious. Hastily, Ash readies two Pokeballs, one to return Garchomp, another to bring out a replacement, though before he can do anything of the sort, Reggie Gear lets out a mighty bellow, telling all assemble that its slow start is finished. Taking a step forward, the Reggie leader wastes no time in proving why it is supreme among its kind, as on Brandon's command, it unleashes a devastating Giga Impact aimed right at Reggie Lecky. Even though the Electric Titan is faster, dodging this initial pass, this does not matter, as it simply allows Reggie Geese to cover more ground and build up more speed as it continues its pursuit until finally it surpasses its creation and slams into it in a showing of its seemingly limitless potential. In the face of such truly legendary power, Reggie Lecky cannot remain standing, and as it collapses beside Reggie Drago, the father and son duo each lob a Pokeball and hold their breath. While in truth this takes no longer than usual, to Ash and Brandon it seems as though the balls rattle for an eternity, so that when they finally chime pleasantly and project digital stars in celebration, Ash can't help but leap into his stoic father's arms, cheering and screaming over and over again that they did it, while Brandon, having expected this reaction, decides to let his son indulge, as he couldn't be any more proud of him, and is confident Ash will do an amazing job raising Reggie Drago. However, here Ash surprises his dad, as he holds the ball out to him, expressing that he really wants him to have the legend and had always planned to give it to him. Beyond shock now, Brandon can't help but reflexively answer no, as he didn't defeat it, and even reminds Ash that Garchomp put everything it had into earning Ash that victory, so why would he want to deny his symbol of it? To this end, Ash stoically responds that he simply isn't ready to wield that kind of strength just yet, especially since the difference between where Ash is and where Brandon is in terms of strength was very clearly demonstrated by this tag match, as like he said, despite holding their own and doing everything they could, it still took all they had and more for him and Garchomp to pull off a win, and it was still a double knockout anyway. Meanwhile, his dad literally fought with a hand tied behind his back, and Regigigas was still able to take down that crazy strong Reggie in one blow. So for now, Ash wants to keep working his way up the ladder until he's worthy of standing beside his dad as an equal, and when that day comes, he wants the knowledge that he did it without the shortcut of a legendary Pokemon. Stunned by this maturity, Brandon allows Ash to hand him the sixth Reggie, completing his collection, but filling his heart with pride as a father much more than as a trainer, as he thanks his son earnestly and pulls him into a hug. However, he does have one objection to this kind act, telling him that no adventurer worth their salt goes crawling around a dungeon or ancient temple and leaves empty-handed, so they'll be calling this a trade. 
afraid, seeing Ash's eyes light up at the prospect of getting one of his father's Pokemon. Sometime later, Ash and Brandon make their way to Freezington's Pokemon Center, which now stands in the shadow of the Battle Pyramid, as this is where everyone had agreed to rendezvous when their tasks were complete. Seeing that they're the last ones back, the father-son duo readily accept mugs of warm Moo Moo milk as they sit by the fire to swap stories, with Barry being very eager to regale them with his tale, not even pausing to elaborate on his lack of appropriate cold weather outfit, as according to Caitlin, he's too dense to feel the cold. When Barry is done, Ash takes his turn recounting the events of their dungeon crawl, with Paul and Barry finding themselves engrossed in the discovery and challenge the boy speaks of, though when Ash reaches the part where he successfully caught Reggie Drago, only to trade away, both his rivals conclude that he must be either insane or criminally dumb. Thankfully, Paul has enough tact to hold his tongue, or Barry is borderline blowing up, now not as keen on bragging about the raid battle against a Gigantamaxed Pokemon, as this news has broken his brain, with the blonde demanding his best buddy at least reveal the Pokemon accepted in trade for a legendary. Sweat dropping, Ash complies, producing the ball of his sixth team member and releasing Brandon's prestigious... Relicanth. Ash traded away a legendary titan for an old fish. Suddenly, Barry finds himself throttling Ash out of fury, as this is really the dumbest thing he's ever done. But saving himself from Barry's wrath, Ash sagely replies that every Pokemon is important in its own way, and what matters is their bonds, pleasing Brandon that his son understood the lesson. Or Barry replies that bonds are all well and good, but not as good as legendary power. With a cheeky grin, Ash asks his friend if he wants to bet, and without thinking, Barry accepts, challenging Ash and Relicanth to a battle, with this soon seeing the two take up place in the battlefield of the Battle Pyramid. Cockily, Barry decides to hammer home just how stupid his friend is with his strongest Pokemon, producing Empoleon, while Relicanth quite calmly remains still in front of Ash on their side. As the match is called to begin, Barry's hothead sees him order Empoleon to take the first attack with a Bubble Beam, which as expected, does little in the way of damage to their fellow water type. Though Barry cheers that that will slow Relicanth down, as he next draws Empoleon to slide in and unleash an onslaught of steel wings that Relicanth and Ash seem either too slow or overwhelmed to retaliate against. Finally, Ash does give his first command, calmly telling the ancient fish to use Yawn, a non-damaging move, causing Barry to yell that it seems like Ash is throwing this match on purpose. Though still serene, the black-haired boy tells him it's quite the opposite as he next instructs Relicanth to use Dive. Briefly, Barry wonders how the fish is meant to dive when there is no water in sight, though the answer comes soon enough, as by slapping its thick tail fin against the battlefield, it is able to propel itself high into the air, then with hitherto unseen speed, it begins to dive, plunging head first towards Empoleon, who in its drowsy state is too slow to dodge. What follows is something Barry cannot comprehend, as despite being an ineffective water move just like his bubble beam, this dive is enough to take Empoleon out in a single hit, seeing the blonde trainer look on in dumbfounded silence with his jaw on the floor, while Caitlyn as ref calls the match for Ash. Running onto the battlefield, Ash praises Relicanth for an amazing job, while a smiling peony makes his way over to Barry to give him the explanation he needs so badly, as he reveals that Brandon has had that Relicanth for as long as he has known him, and even back then, it wasn't a Pokemon to be taken lightly, but now with so much more power and wisdom born of age, he's not entirely sure if he could beat it in a 1v1, or calling it impressive on Ash's part that he can get such a high level Pokemon to listen to him. Speaking up now too, partially so Barry doesn't think he scammed his own son out of a legendary Pokemon, Branton adds that this decision was also motivated because he doesn't get to use Relicanth much in his battle facility, so he's happy his old friend is getting a chance to go on more adventures with his son, even if he's fairly certain the old fish won't particularly care one way or the other, knowing it in its crotchety ways. This causes Barry to pout that he wishes his dad gave him an awesome Pokemon he trained personally, even offering Ash to trade his newest catch for it, causing Caitlin to chide that he shortchanged his tune on Relicanth pretty fast, as the group all have a good laugh at Barry's expense, while he gets flustered and threatens to find them all trillions. And that's where we'll leave things. What's next for our hero having now achieved their mission in Gala? Which Pokemon did Barry catch during his advent tour? And are the boys finally ready to take on Palmer and complete their Battle Frontier adventure? Find out as the journey continues.